Good morning. Welcome to worship here on this Sunday morning at Peace. We are glad to have you here. Uh, this morning, I've got just a few announcements I want to make before we begin with worship. The first is that next week is the start of a new worship series calling, we're calling Bible Reboot. We're going to be going through some different stories throughout the Bible, starting first with the Old Testament, um, and next week is creation. So that will be beginning next week. As well as, do not forget, the car show is coming here at the end of September, in September 21st. So bring your cars, your trucks, whatever other fun vehicles you have to show um, and be a part of. And we also have one last announcement, which is that the men's club is back. And they're going to have a steak dinner on September 14th at 5.30. The cost is $20, and you can sign up at the information booth out in the Northex before you leave. Um, so come, join and get to be a part of all of that with us. Uh, as we begin, I invite you to stand and greet those around you. Let's say our Bible verse of the week together. So, therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for the opening hymn. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. 
We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
O merciful Lord, you did not spare your only son, but delivered him up for us all. Grant us courage and strength to take up the cross and follow him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land of the Lord, sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson this morning is Paul's letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I refer, preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own free will. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes anything to you, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me every, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Our gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of St. Luke, the 14th chapter. This will also serve as the sermon text for Vicar Bryce's sermon this morning. Now great crowds accompanied Jesus, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for the sermon hymn.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, have you ever known somebody who is calm, cool, and collected? I'm talking about a person who normally is never bothered when things go wrong. A person who does not get bent to out of shape when something doesn't go the way they expected. If you know someone like this, and you've ever seen them get mad or lose their cool, then you know that that's an unexpected moment. It's not the way you expect this person to be. That can come as a shock when we see people who are normally one way speak or act in a way we haven't seen before. When I think about my life, there's a few people who come to mind, but there's actually a television character who I think is the pinnacle of this idea. If you've ever seen NBC's 30 Rock, then you know the character Kenneth Parcell. If you've never seen the show, that's okay. I'll introduce you to him. In the show, Kenneth is an intern at Rockefeller Center in New York City. He works with a crew on a Saturday Night Live-like sketch comedy show, and he's always full of joy and always is walking around the halls with a smile. Nothing ever really bothers him, no matter the outrageous requests the people make for him. He is the most positive character I have ever seen in a book or a movie or a television show. He's not one who gets angry often, but the few times he does in the show, the characters respond accordingly. They don't know what to say when the calm and happy guy all of a sudden is upset with them or is yelling or is unsure of what's going on. And so there's this shocked feeling the characters and the audience gets watching the show when Kenneth speaks in a way they're not used to. I think in our gospel reading this morning that Jeff wrote, uh, read for us just a few moments ago, I think we experience perhaps a similar shocked feeling to Jesus' words. We're used to hearing good things from Jesus. Come to me and I will give you rest. Do not be anxious. Consider the lilies of the field. But in our reading this morning, we hear him say, you must hate your family. Give up your life and all that you own to be my disciple. I don't think most of us would expect these things to come from Jesus' mouth, but they do. And I want to be clear before we go any farther that Jesus is not speaking this way out of frustration or anger. Jesus' words are intentional, clear and direct to the people that are there with him. And so to better understand these statements from Jesus and these demands he makes, I think we should start from the beginning. So in the first two uh, verses of our reading, we have the scene set for us. Jesus is still traveling towards Jerusalem, still traveling towards what he knows is coming. And with him is this massive crowd, actually massive crowds uh, following him. And so among these crowds are people who have been with him for a while, who have been his followers already for who knows how long. But also he has people with him who are on the fence, who don't know how long they want to follow him for. And so there are probably families in these crowds, sons and daughters with their parents, and there are young folks who are come to hear what Jesus has to say. These crowds want to learn from this great teacher. And so they're probably wondering, like we do when we come on Sundays, what good news does this teacher have for us today? And so as they stand there, Ears perked up, listening for Jesus' words, they hear him say, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What a reaction this must have gotten. I can imagine those in the crowd now looking at their families, wondering, does he really mean this? 
Mothers probably looked at their sons saying, do I really have to hate you to be his disciple? I think that's the question on anyone's minds who've heard these words since that day. Does Jesus mean it when he says hate? Yes, Jesus means it. He's speaking directly, but it's important for us sitting here in the 21st century to understand what's meant by hate in the first century. Jesus is not calling sons to have a great disdain for their fathers. He's not telling mothers to wish the worst for their daughters. Jesus is speaking of a hate that is not so closely tied to emotions, but more tied to one's actions. Jesus knows what's coming for his disciples. And so he tells them, you may have a day where you turn away from your families, where you have to follow me instead of listening to your mother or father because they command something God has forbidden. So on those days, when they have a father who tells them to disobey God, the disciples, the people Jesus speaks to is saying, you must turn away, you must hate them and follow me. And this was not hard for the people in the crowds to envision. Christianity was not the norm at this point in time. To follow Jesus meant to go against the beliefs of your family, your friends, and your community, unless you were fortunate enough for them to also be Christians by this point. So for those in the crowd, they can probably imagine the conversation when they get home. Dad, I have chosen to follow Jesus as Lord. That conversation is one that will most likely end with them outside of the home, all on their own, potentially even shunned by their families. And so for those in the crowd still considering to if they're going to follow Jesus, it means to follow him, a loss of their family, and quickly. And so if this first statement from Jesus was not shocking enough, then he continues with another. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Again, a statement that is shocking, disgusting. It fills probably the thoughts of these crowds with disgust. Because for these crowds, bearing the cross is not a term that means dealing with hardships in one's life, but it's a very present reality that they are seeing around them. If you've ever seen the Passion of the Christ, you know what a crucifixion might look like, and that's what they're envisioning. To bear their own cross is to lose their own lives. And so when these words, when this statement of Jesus lands in the hearer's ears, they envision a horrific scene. A scene where a person is arrested, beaten, tortured, humiliated, and mocked in the worst way possible for everyone in the public to see. And so at this point in our text from this morning, Jesus gives us a little insight into why he's speaking in shocking ways. For those in the crowd who are on the fence, who aren't sure how far they're going to follow Jesus, he wants to make it clear what it costs to be his disciple. He gives two anal analogies about these people who are preparing uh, to make a big decision, and these men are both considering the cost of what their actions will lead to. They're making sure that they know what will come so that they do not fail horribly. And so those, to those in the crowd that are on the fence, Jesus is laying out the possible losses that come with following him. Because Jesus does not want followers just when life is easy, but rather he knows what is coming to his disciples and wants them to be prepared. And so with that, we come to our Bible verse of the week. One that kind of sums up all of this in one phrase. Jesus says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus gives the final warning of what might come. 
Already he's told the crowd that they must be willing to turn away from their families and to even give up their own lives to follow him. But just in case anyone missed it, he makes it clear that if you follow him, you may have to give up all that you own outside of those things. And he isn't telling them to go sell everything they have right in this moment, but rather he's telling them a time might come where that is required. And so for those in the crowd who want to be Jesus' disciple, they may have to give up his fa- their family, their friends, their treasures, and even their lives. And for all of us who know the rest of the Gospels and knows what happens to the disciples, we know that many of those in the crowd did exactly that. Out of all of the apostles that followed Jesus, only one died from living a long life. All of the disciples, all of the apostles gave up all that they had to follow Jesus and spread the good news. And most of them gave up their lives. And so I wonder, with our readings this morning, if Jesus has Peter in mind when he spoke to the crowds. Peter is the disciple who pretty constantly speaks up for the group. He almost seems like some kind of leader, but he often puts his own foot in his mouth as well. But it's also Peter who on Pentecost preaches a sermon about Christ that brings 3,000 souls to the faith. And it's also Peter who gave up everything he had, including his life, going to Rome to be crucified, bearing his own cross physically. And so Peter, who's standing in this crowd, is just one of the few who knows that these words of Jesus ring true by the end of his life. And so to this crowd, Jesus is making it clear. To be my disciple comes with a great cost. And for all of us sitting here this morning, we already know this as well. We here are not the crowds on the fence wondering if we should follow Jesus. We are already his disciples. For many of us, some of these costs we've already had to face. For some, you've lost relationships with families or friends because of your faith. For others of you, you've lost opportunities in life or you've had to make decisions because it went against your faith. Jesus knows that this is coming to us all. And for us here, we've faced this. And fortunately, we do not need to fear for our lives like the early Christians, like Peter, needed to. But there's others in the world who still do. Nigeria, Afghanistan, and North Korea are just three of the top countries in which persecution of Christians is high. Last year, 17 Christians were killed a day in Nigeria just for their faith alone. And so it's in these places and others around the world that our brothers and sisters are still giving their lives to spread this good news. And so, still today, the cost of discipleship is great. But, I come to you this morning with good news. Like all the disciples did before me, from Peter to Pastor Dave to all the other disciples of Christ in between. Even though there are great costs associated with discipleship, there are greater costs rewards. And we need to talk about them. So Jesus says that you may have to turn away from your family, but at the same time, he gives you a greater family, a larger family, a family that spans all of time and space. And they're sitting right next to you. For all of you who are sitting in the front, turn around and look at those sitting behind you. For those in the front, make sure that you greet those who are sitting way in front of you this morning, because these are your brothers and sisters. These people are a part of your family, and we're all joined together because of Jesus. And this family is not contained in this one moment, or within these walls here at peace. 
All over the world, there are other Christians who are part of our family. You know, the youth gathering that happened back in July, I think, could really be called a family reunion with 20,000 members in attendance. Imagine having to make the food for that family reunion. And this family, that not only includes the 20,000 at the youth gathering, not only the people within peace, not only the Christians around the world, includes people like Abraham, Noah, and even Adam. And it includes all the people who will come in the future that we don't even know or can't even imagine. And so, what does a family do? There's three things I'm going to suggest to you this morning. First, a family, they care for one another. A family, they gather together. And a family, they celebrate together. We can serve and care for one another in all different ways and in all different times. I've seen it happen already here at Peace. When people have gotten hurt, I've seen others rush to their aid. When we have funerals here in the fellowship hall or here in the sanctuary, there are groups that are taking care of the meal and are there for the grieving families. So one of the things we do together is we care for one another. And we continue to do it with already how good we do that already. We also can gather together, like we've done this morning. We've all gathered here to be at church, but we can also gather at other times. We did that last week for our picnic. We've got a car show coming up where we'll gather together again. But I also encourage you to gather together in your everyday life. For those of you who enjoy going on walks around town, ask those around you here at church this morning if they'd like to join you. If you like to go to the park, or you like to go on hikes, or you like to go to a nearby zoo or a lake, invite others with you like you would your family at home. And we can also celebrate together. This is something else that I've enjoyed seeing since I came here to peace. Because in our morning devotions on Facebook, one of the things we always do is make sure to let you know whose birthday is that day and whose wedding anniversaries are that day. So all of us can celebrate with them. And I also saw this last week. If you were, happened to be at the picnic on Sunday, or if you watched the video after the fact, you'll see that we all sang to Pastor Dave, whose birthday was this last Monday. Or for Anna, who can't hide, uh, <laughs> her birthday was this last week as well, and I heard the halls of the students and the teachers singing for her. And I'm sure the same will come for those who celebrate later. And so we as a family can do these three things together and we can be intentional about it. Be intentional about caring for another, intentional about gathering together, and intentional about celebrating with one another. Oh, but the family is not just the only reward. If you thought having this greater family was good, well, good news, there's a few more that come. The next reward comes because when Jesus says to be prepared to lose your life for him, he gives you a life everlasting. A life that does not have pain and suffering, a life that is empty of worry and fear. When he says to be prepared to bear your cross, he knows already the one he's going to in Jerusalem. And through the cross, he gives you this everlasting life. An everlasting life lived with this family. And Jesus says you might have to give up all that you have to follow him, but he gives you all you need. Our heavenly father of this family richly and daily gives us what is needed for this life. And he gives us the most important thing. Through the cross, Jesus gives us his blood takes away our sins, the only thing we cannot remove from ourselves. And so that blood gives us the everlasting life. And when you're baptized into Christ's death, resurrection, and death, you are joined into this family with the rest of us. It is only through Jesus' own cross that we can bear our own and give up all that we have. 
and it is through this cross that these great rewards are given to you. And so with these things in mind, like all the other disciples before us, like all the apostles who have gone and most of who died for this faith, we can go and proclaim the good news about Jesus without fear to our friends, to our families. And this means we can spend time with each other, caring for each other, knowing that this family is one that lasts forever. And it means, too, that we can be willing to die if the time ever came, knowing that Jesus will keep us and we will be with him forever. As we come to an end this morning, I'd like to share the story of another man with you. Another man who does some pretty shocking things. His name was Polycarp. You've probably never heard that name before, but he is a person who died in 156 AD. He was a student of John the Apostle. Polycarp was wanted by the authorities. He was wanted only because he was the disciple of Christ and sharing the news about him. And so the authorities hunted him down, tracking him to this house outside of the city. And when, he find, and when they found him and they came to him, he acted and responded in a shocking way. He didn't fight. He didn't run. He didn't try to wiggle his way out of it. Instead, when the soldiers came to him to arrest him, he made them a meal. And then he prayed. And after two hours of prayer, and when the soldiers had finished their meal, they, the soldiers felt horrible and regretted of what they were about to do. But they did it anyways. And so Polycarp was arrested and taken to Rome like Peter was. And when he's taken to the arena, there's kings and there's crowds attempting to make him renounce his faith, to make him turn away from Jesus. He's threatened with lions and with swords, but he stood firm and never ran away. And so on that day, February 23rd of 156 AD, Polycarp died for being a disciple of Christ. But on that day, too, he entered into his everlasting life. And so I share this story of Polycarp and of Peter and of John and all the other apostles because they showed us what it was like to be Christ's disciple, to give up these things that Christ spoke about. And so when the time came, all of them followed Jesus instead of running away. And because of his faith, Polycarp is also a part of our family together. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with confessing our shared faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Beginning September 12th, we will be having a care group for those who have lost loved ones called Grief Share, and we're now going to show a little video that explains a little more what that is. We'll also receive the offering.
I immediately went back to work so that I didn't have to think about my father's death. I was very fearful of going through any process that would make me have to revisit my father's death. I was afraid the pain would open a door to something that I couldn't handle. I started experiencing uh, depression. It was slow at first. Um, it began with just overwhelming feelings of being discontent. Um, and it started escalating. And eventually, depression and the emptiness was more overwhelming than the thought of facing the grief. The process of finally dealing with the grief began with Grief Share. It's very much like going to the ocean and wanting to take a swim. You've got that initial wave that comes at you and then you have to face it, let it come over you, and then you shake yourself off and get ready for the next one. And the process of Grief Share helped me do that. With each wave that came, with each new lesson that I learned, I was able to let it wash over me, process it, and use it to move forward. I love talking about my father now. I love sharing his stories. I love watching videos. I love looking at the pictures, the memories. He was a wonderful man. Now I feel like having accepted the loss I can now celebrate the life he had and feel joy for those times. Grief Share is a support group open to men and women dealing with the death of a loved one. To learn more about Grief Share, speak to the Grief Share leader at your church.
We have a couple of additions to the prayers you already find in your worship folder. We'll be praying for the family of Jerry Remington. Jerry is the father of Nikki Heinzen, and he passed away this previous week. We'll also be praying for Liz Hankey. Liz is a granddaughter of Gary and Penny Krieger. She was uh, shot as an innocent bystander in Milwaukee on Friday evening. And she has had a surgery. She is now home, but will be having further surgeries this next week. Good Lord, we commend to you all who bear office in our land and ask you to make them a blessing to those they serve. Bless all first responders as they serve and care for us in our times of need. And bless also those who serve in our nation's armed forces as they defend our nation and its freedom. Lord God, grant to us every joy on this Labor Day weekend in the jobs you have given us to do that we might render service to you and to our neighbors. Remember those in need of honest labor and daily bread and give them gainful employment according to your good and gracious will. O oh Lord, Give the strength of the Spirit to all who are suffering in any kind of need, including members Jack Greening, Joe Schrader, Gary Krieger, and Naomi Engelman. For friends and family, Liam Hayek, Hank Resch, Natalie Dobson, and Liz Hankey. Those injured in military service and those known to each of us. Grant them comfort and healing according to your good and gracious will. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of the members of our Peace Lutheran Ministries family of believers and pray for all, whatever their needs might be. We name today Mary Jane Roosh, Kyle, Anna, Evelyn, and Grace Rustic, Alan and Susan Schilker, Cody and Lucas Schilker, Pat Schmidt, and Tina, Mike, Megan, and Jonathan Schmidt. Lead us to grow in our faith and grant that we might follow Jesus Christ in our loving service to one another. Merciful Lord, care for the family and friends of Marvin Wendt and Jerry Remington, granting them comfort and strength in their time of loss as they mourn the passing of their loved ones. Loving Father, we thank and praise you for bringing Joshua Carolus and Jessica Niemeyer together in holy matrimony in Chicago yesterday. Bless them in their life together, and may Christ always be in the center of their marriage. Father of all, we thank you for the birth of a healthy baby girl, Etta Jane Kakish, born to Aaron and Sidney Kakish. Be with her and bless her throughout her life. Preserve us, O Lord, from all temptation, and grant us faith, that we may rest all our prayers and the desires of our hearts in your merciful arms for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand with me as we pray the prayer the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and in the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. 
Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. seated. Welcome to the Lord's table. Take it. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to bring you to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.